All right, my KM116 students, I hope you are doing well. I'm staying safe out there. So, uh, the, I have uploaded the PowerPoint slides. For today, it's titled Week 4, Part 1. It's on eCampus. I haven't uh, operated the knowledge check assignment yet. Now, because of the outage that we're going to have, which I'm assuming starts like very early in the morning this Thursday, so I will probably extend the due date for knowledge check for week four. It'll be probably be Tuesday, either noon or probably midnight is what I'm thinking. But again, I will let you know. All right. So last week, as I was talking about acid base, acid base equilibria, there are a couple of topics that I wanted to finish but couldn't. So this is where uh, I'm going to hopefully try to finish it today. So I'm going to focus on buffers, how to find the pH of buffer, go into a little depth into the concepts of Lewis acids and bases, and then it's considered a polyprotic acids and bases. And this remaining topics from acid base equilibria. <clears throat> All right, so this might look familiar. Uh, this was the slide I went, talked about before your exam too. So basically, the way we have defined we define polyprotic acids was if you think about just HCl, right? Whenever it breaks in, reacts with water, you get the hydronium ion and Cl minus. But this HCl has only one ionizable hydrogen, all right? Now, anytime I use the word ionizable hydrogen, it's the same as ionizable proton. Keep that in mind. So proton is the same as hydrogen whenever we're talking about this concept. So this HCl is going to be called monoprotic acid because it has only one proton to give. Right? That's why the word protic from proton, mono being one. Now, if you have any acids, such as these, which has more than one ionizable proton, look at that, so it has two of them. S3PO4 phosphoric acid has three of them. Carbonic acid has two of them. Then those will be called polyprotic acids. And now the protons are locked in a stepwise manner in this. So what does that mean? What's this? So let's say whenever s 3 po loses its first electron, sorry, not first proton, or first hydrogen, all right, the way it loses first hydrogen, whenever it loses first hydrogen, then you're gonna get HSO4 minus. That's the first step. All right, now in the second step, remember, you have two of these ionizable proton or ionizable hydrogen here, right? So that means this hydrogen is again can be lost. And then you get the conjugate base of this acid right here as sulfate. This is how prunes are lost in a polyprotic acid. All right, so now keeping in mind, always remember the fully protonated or any acid which has the all full protons there will be the strongest acid, meaning that if I ask to compare the acidity of H2SO4 and HSO4, definitely H2SO4 is way stronger than HSO4. All right, so this is gonna be my number one. This is gonna be my number two, definitely not surprisingly. This is gonna be my weakest acid, right? Because first thing is it doesn't even have ionizable proton, all right? So what I mean by H2SO4 is more acid than hydrogen sulfate. The concept behind this is HSO4 minus condenser negative charge. It's hard to remove this H 
from a negatively charged ion compared to a neutral species. And that's why this is way more acidic than this. This is a four minus. All right, now, how does Alexas give some polyphenolic acids? So it gives an example. It gives you a question of sulfuric acid, which is a polyphenolic acid. It asks to write down the balanced chemical equations for the sequence of reactions that sulfuric acid can undergo when it's dissolved in water. All right, so let's start with the first one. So again, this is the same concept as what I did here, right? This one right here was the first step. This right here is the second step. That's all I have to show. But then I have to show into much more a balanced chemical equation form when dissolving water. So the way to do it is my first step or first sequence, if you want to call it, right? You have the sulfuric acid or it dissolved in water, right? That's why the AQ aqueous, you have liquid water. Since it's a strong acid, remember what uh, Arrhenius theory of acid said that acids, whenever they dissolve in water, they produce hydronium ion. Same thing happens here. Right, so basically think about this, one of these H bonded to this H, two O, right? And then you got this H3O plus, that's what's remaining here. One H from here and then SO4 minus. So this is my first sequence of the reaction. All right, but like we said, H2SO has two ionizable protons. And so in my second sequence, I'm gonna take my this SO4, which has the proton, and again, dissolving in the water. And again, my product is always hydronium ion. It has to be the hydronium ion. The way you form hydronium ion is basically H2O bonding with this H. That means what you are left is the SO4 2 minus. And then make sure you check and then everything is balanced, right? So if you have a first sequence, everything is balanced. I have one, two, three, four hydrogen, three plus one, four hydrogen in the product side, one sulfur in the reactant side, one sulfur in the reactant side, five oxygen atoms in the reactant side, four, five oxygen atoms, right? Even the charges, overall charge here on my left hand side is zero. Overall charge here is zero, right? Because plus one and minus one, they add up to give you zero or neutral charge overall. All right, so based on that, your first knowledge of the question, it's asking you write balanced chemical equations for the second sequence. All right, remember, this is your first sequence. I'm talking about the second sequence. But for which acid? I'm talking about phosphoric acid and when it's dissolved in water. So I hope this makes sense and this example that I gave you helps you answer this question. All right, so now Alex gives you more problem on polyprotic acid. So what it wants you to solve is, let's say if a polyprotic acid is in equilibrium and you prepare some kind of a solution for it, then it will ask you what is the equilibrium molarity or equilibrium concentration of sulfate ion in molarity. All right, so now, I mean, I think I, I should be able to do the first step here uh, in this screen. Let me see how much space I have. The way to answer this question is, just remember, these are the two reactions that I'm looking at, right? Because you're talking about sulfuric acid, but again, remember, we talked about how sulfuric acid is a polyperitic acid, meaning that in the first step, it's gonna form HSO4 minus, then in the second step, it's gonna form SO4 two minus. All right, so if you focus on the second step, this is what my second step looks like, right? Here, this is my second step. Isn't it? 
if I write that dummy in here, it look like this. My SSO4 minus plus water liquid giving me S3 uh, S3O plus aqueous plus SO4 2 minus. All right, so now Alex does give you the K A value of this. But the way it gives you, it gives you in this form. All right, so let me write on the first reaction as well that we can see it clearly. My first reaction is going to be like H2SO4. I'm just going to remove the increase to save me myself some time, all right? So make sure you write that down in the exam, the exam here. Plus SSO4 minus. Right? Now, Alex gives you the Ka value of this. Term I'm going to call it is Ka1 rather than just Ka because I'm talking about the first ionizable proton here. The Ka1 value that is being given to you is what is it? Somewhere. It's going to be very large. Looks like they do, do not give you value. It's just going to be tell you very, very large. Not surprisingly, because s 2 is a very, very strong acid. And what we had said is the capital Ka, or the acid dissociation constant, or acid ionization constant, is very, very large for strong acids. Whereas for this, as access for minus, we're going to call it Ka2, because remember, this was the second proton that was dissociated right the k2 value is going to be 0 0.01203 which tells you that oh hs is way more stronger acid than hs4 minus now let me write on my k2 setup how it's going to look like right my equation is going to look like k2 is going to be concentration of s3o plus Concentration of SO4 2 minus paired by concentration of HSO4 minus. All right, so now the question is if I am able to figure out, because remember, I have to find the equilibrium molarity of SO4 2 minus. I have to find the concentration of this. That's my end goal. Right? I have my KA2 from the Alex data source. That means if I can find the concentration of S3O plus in the solution, and then the concentration of HSO4 minus in the solution, then I should be able to figure out my sulfate anion concentration or the equilibrium molarity of sulfate anion. All right, so the first thing that I'm going to do is, so I don't think I'm going to have space here, so let me use my Let's keep this for right now. All right, the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to use my first reaction. All right, I remember S2SO4 is a strong acid. It's K1 is very, very large. That means all of these acids will break down and form the hydronium ion and HSO4 minus. You see how these are one is to one molar? So without further doing setting up the ice table, what I can say is the concentration of H2SO4, this is a very strong acid, will equals to the concentration of S3 plus and HSO minus. Because remember it's one is to one molar, right? So think about this way. One mole of H2SO4 breaks down to form one mole of S3O plus and one mole of HSO4 minus. Since the volume is going to be the same, that's why I'm making a claim that H2SO4, since it is a strong acid, is going to have the same concentration as S3O plus as well as HSO4 minus, which for me has been given in the question, right? It tells me suppose a 0 0.031 molar aqueous solution of salt 
sulfuric acid. That means the concentration of sulfuric acid has been given to me. All of these values will equal to 0 0.031 molar. All right. Now I'm going to write down my second equation. All right. So now if you go back to your second equation, so this was my second equation right here. As I suppose this. So let me write down the ice table for the second equation right here. So let me just change the color. So it's easier for you to see. So we have HSO4 minus aqueous plus water liquid giving you H3 plus aqueous plus SO2 minus. All right. Then I'm going to create my ice table here. Because remember, in my first step, this happened, right? Now for this, what's going to happen? Sorry, for this reaction, the equilibrium concentration of what I found over here, that will be the initial concentration for this reaction. What I mean by that is, that means SSO4 minus value of 0 0.031, right, is going to be my initial concentration. Because remember, my end goal is to find the equilibrium concentration of sulfate and ion, right? This is what I'm trying to find, right? The equilibrium concentration of sulfate and ion. And I know that the H3O plus is also 0 0.031 molar, right? So I'm going to write that down. And remember, we talked about liquid and solid state you know, swap in our equilibrium constant or acid ionization dissociation constant equation or expression. And sulfate anion at the very beginning, remember, in this reaction, sulfate anion hasn't formed yet. So I'm going to call that a zero. So we're going to use the coefficient in front of this balance reaction, right? So who is going to start reacting with the water to give that? That's why minus x, and there is one in front of it. That's why minus one x, same thing as minus x. And since as SO4 two minus is going to start forming, that's why plus x. Since s two plus is the product side, that's why it's going to be plus x as well. I mean, since my equilibrium is the sum of initial and change, so concentration of HSO4 minus at equilibrium is going to be this. This for S3 plus and then for SO4, it's going to be plus X. All right, so I just remember. Now I can use the K2 expression, right? Because the K2 expression can be used for the equilibrium concentrations of this species. I'm going to go back to my thing. Again, make sure you have written down your note. So let's go, and go back to our slide and see if I can plug in these values. All right, so now let me write down the, in whatever value I got at equilibrium, I'm gonna use this equation, right? So K2 value has been given as 0 0.01023 concentration of s 3 plus. The equilibrium concentration that I found was 0 0.031 plus x. Concentration of sulfate anion is something I do not know. So I think for our from our ice table it was x value. So I'm just gonna write down x here. And then the concentration of SS4 minus equilibrium concentration was 0 0.031 minus x. After this, now this is where it's going to be really challenging for you all. If it's a quadratic equation, I would just go ahead and solve the quadratic equation. The reason being, I can go through how Alex taught you, right? And because it will ask you to kind of do some approximation, and then after you get an answer, it says, Oh, the approximation is too high, that's why we cannot use that tactic. 
right? So again, the idea as to why the approximation doesn't work here is because the K2 value here, here is too big. You can only use that kind of, those kind of approximations that I taught you only when the k value is very, very big, greater than 10 to the power 3, or smaller than 10 to the power negative 3. That's the only time I would use the approximation. Since the k2 value is not less than 10 to the power negative 3, or not greater than 10 to the power 3, that's why I'm not going to use the approximation and just solve it out as a quadratic equation. So whenever I set this up, it's going to look like this, right? So my x squared plus 0.04123x minus 3.171 times 10 to the power minus 4 equals to 0. Then I can solve for x, right? It's in the form of x squared plus bx plus c. Then I set my formula for x for the quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals to 0 is going to be minus b plus minus b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. So whenever I use this, a as 1, b as 0 0.04123, and c as negative. 3.171 times 10 to the power negative 4, my x value is going to be either, remember, I have a plus minus here, right? So keep that in mind. That's why I'm going to have two values for x. Possible values. One value is 0 0.006626. The other value of x can be negative 0 0.04786. But since we had said that x refers to the concentration of sulfate anion, and the concentration can never be a negative number, right? That's why this is not the correct concentration of sulfate anion. That means this is going to be the concentration of sulfate anion in at equilibrium. 0 0.006626. Two six fix 0 0.0066 molarity. I hope this makes sense. Okay, so now. So in order to check two, what I've given you is, so instead of starting with 0 0.031 molar equation solution, what I'm asking you to do is start with 0 0.015 molar sulfuric acid solution. And after that, all you have to do is figure out the equilibrium morality of the concentration of sulfate and ion. And then to make your life easy, you can use the Ka1 and Ka2 value from previous slide right here, where I've said that K1 is very, very large because it is a very, very strong acid. And K2 is around this number, 0 0.01023. All right, so now next concept. Now this is something I talked about, but I'm gonna revisit this because this is a really important concept, all right? As to how we define something as strong or weak acids, all right? So the easy way to think about this, right, is basically we said if a species has an ionizable proton, right, such as H, in front of any other element A, and if we can break this bond easily and furnish or get more H+, plus, which when it deals in water gives you the H3O+, plus, that's why they write that as H3O+. Plus. Right, and if you would think what we can get more H plus if this bond right here is weak, right? That means if this bond is weak, means this HA is going to be your strong acid. And this is a very good example, right? So you have HF, HCl, SBr, and HI. So if you look at a period table, right, they are all in group seven. 17 or group 7a they are called halogens all right and then they're gonna be like fluorine is in period one then fluorine chlorine bromine and iodine all right so what they're telling me is if the bond strength or the bond energy includes for mole of these 
hydrogen and this halogen are given to you. Right, and look at that, the bond strength decreases as you go to the right, right? So let me erase all that. Right, so if you look at the bond strength right here, 570, 574 HF, 432 for HCl, that means the bond strength is decreasing as you go to the right. And what's going to happen to the strength of acid? Remember, make sure you revisit the concept of pKa. What we have said was the lower the pKa, the stronger the acid, right? And look at that. The strength of acid increases. as the bond strength decreases. Now the question is, why does the bond strength decrease as you go from FCL, BR, and ion? Like I told you, in group seven, as you go down a group, this is what's gonna look like. At fluorine is in period one, chlorine is in period two, bromine is here, and iodine is here, all right? So what's going to happen is fluorine is a pretty small atom. And what we had said was the atomic radius of an element increases as you go down a group, right? That means, let's say, I'm just going to make a relative size of what would hydrogen bonded with fluorine, hydrogen bonded with chlorine, and bromine and iodine would look like, all right? So now hydrogen and fluorine, they're in the same period. Right, so that means if this is my hydrogen, uh, my fluorine might be pretty similar in size, right? I'm just going to call that. Now, next one is hydrogen and chlorine. Chlorine is bigger than fluorine because it's down one period, right? So that means if my hydrogen is like this size, my chlorine is going to be this size. Now, if I keep going and doing this, my hydrogen and bromine is going to look like something like this. This is my hydrogen. And then, boom, this all is going to be my bromine. All right. Now, do you see how, like, this right here, since they are kind of tight, there's going to be better overlap between hydrogen and chlorine compared to this hydrogen and chlorine compared to hydrogen and bromine. And that's why. Because of this better overlap, the bond strength is strongest. The bond energy is the highest, in other words. That means H and F has the highest bond strength or highest bond energy. So I hope this makes sense. Now, based on this concept, there's your knowledge check three. So I've given you hypothetical acid and the bond strength. So this is the bond strength, or bond energy, whatever you're going to call it, same thing. Basically, all it tells you is how much energy you need to put in to break this bond, right? If I wanted to break this bond apart into H plus and A minus, I have to put in 412 kilojoules of energy. That's all the bond energy tells you. And then I'm asking you to rank these acids, H, A, S, B, S, C, H, X, and X, Y, whose bond strength has been given to you from the highest to the lowest PKA. From the, sorry, from the lowest to the highest PKA. That's it. Right? Pretty similar to this concept. If you understood this concept, you should be able to answer this question. And then just to make sure that uh, you are comparing apples to apples, I have said that. Assume the elements A, B, C, X, and Y are in the same group, right? Because remember, whenever we talked about this example, F, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, these elements were in the same group, group 7A, or halogen group. That's why I make sure that you realize that's important part of this comparison. All right, so next concept I'm going to talk about. It's something called acid based titration, something that you have learned in Chem 115. So basically, 
this was taught to you as one of the quantitative analysis technique, right? So basically, easy way to think about this is basically, let's say, if you, uh, I don't have any drink here. So anyways, so let's say I give you a Coke, a can of Coke. Now, if you read the ingredients in a can of Coke, right, they will write down uh, carb, how many gra grams are there, sugar, how many grams of sugar are there. And below that, you're going to see like uh, what kind of other chemicals are in the Coke, right? So something like they might have carbonic acid, they might have some other kind of acid, right? And then they even have Coke. Most people drink Coke because they want that caffeine that's in it. Besides the sweetness that's in there, people drink Coke to have that caffeine, to be alert, to be awake, right? So now let's see if I give you a can of Coke. And remember, a can of Coke does not tell you how much caffeine is in there. So it might be 50 milligram, it might be 100 milligram, it might be 200 milligram, it might be one gram for all I know. Let's say if you're a chemist and if I asked you, take this kind of code and then I want you to figure out the concentration of caffeine that's in that Coke or the amount of caffeine that's in that Coke, then what you're going to do is something called quantitative analysis. So I hope this kind of concept makes sense. All right. And Titusen is another example, right, of a method of a quantitative analysis. So in Titusen, what we do is we determine the concentration of acid or base by neutralizing it with the standard solution of base or acid. So what I mean by that is basically, let's say, this is a pure sodium hydroxide with a strong base. All right, so let's say even you knew the concentration of this as 0 0.50 molar. And let's say I give you 10 ml of an acid HCl, and I ask you, figure out the concentration of that acid. And what you do is you take that 10 ml of that hydrochloric acid, right? So my HCl is over here. All right. And then by titrating it with a known concentration of NaOH, you can figure out the concentration of HCl. And something, if you remember from K115, what you might have done is you added something called an indicator here, right? That monitored the change in color. All right now, on the couple of formulas that I want you to be comfortable with is now the solution with the known concentration that's in the burette, we call that a titrant. And the solution whose concentration I'm trying to figure out, which is in the flask down here, we call that an analyte. That means in my earlier example of caffeine, where I asked you, you're a chemist in the lab, where I asked you to figure out the concentration of caffeine in the can of Coke, that means my analyte is going to be my caffeine in the Coke, right? And then my burette, depending upon what I wanted to tighten it with, might contain some other solution, but anything in the burette is going to be called a titrant. All right, so now how does this work? Again, I'm not going to go into depth, but these are the two common terms that you should be comfortable with, something called equivalence point and the end point. So you put in the indicator, right? So now after you put in the indicator, let's assume that this color right here, after you put the indicator, one drop or two drops, let's say the color was pink. All right, then let's say you're gonna start dropping this sodium hydroxide from this burette, and then you drop one ml, you shake it on the ml, and at a point you might start like dropping dropwise, and there's giving me a point where that pink color might go to colorless. Now that point at which there is a change in color, where the indicator changes the color, that's called the end point. 
all right okay that's fine and dandy but then now you might be wondering but don't we need to put in the equivalent form of any words because if i'm trying to do this example right my question is going to look like this my hcl aqueous aqueous is going to react with my aqueous sodium hydroxide and i'm going to get nacl plus water HCl. right now remember this is all aqueous all right and then this equation is already balanced meaning that one equivalent of hcl must react with one mole of one mole of hcl must react with one mole of NaOH. all right now whenever that happens whenever i start dropping the naoh and there's going to be a point where this naoh one mole of it will have reacted with this one mole of hcl and that point we define that as equivalent point the point in the titration where the stoichiometric amount of the titrant has been added right that means you added this one equivalent of NaOH to one equivalent of HCl. And that point is called the equivalence point. And in theory, what we want is equivalent point to be very, very close to end point. Otherwise, you'll have added more NaOH or less NaOH, and then you miss the whole point of HBS titration, right? That's why whenever chemists design all these indicators, they have to keep lots of things in mind. What are some of the things that you have to keep in mind? And again, make sure you know the difference between endpoint and equivalence point, really, really important. For example, three point of view. There are things that chemists, scientists have to think about whenever they design an indicator, right? So first thing, the color change must be easily detected, right? So let's say if the color change is from pink to Let's say just light pink, and that's a very bad example of indicator, right? It's hard to say, like, okay, we have a pink color, light pink, at what point do we call that a light pink, all right? But let's see if you have this change from going from uh, pink to blue, right? That can be easily rejected by our naked eye. Does that make sense? And that's why this color change must be easily rated. That should be the first important property of a good indicator. The other one is the color change must be rapid. You don't want the pink to go to, let's say, blue in an hour or so, right? As soon as you hit that end point, the pink must directly change the color to blue. Right, not linger for pink, and then after I stick it for five minutes, then change that to blue. That's not going to be helpful. The next one is very, very important, right? Because remember, we do put our indicator in this analyte solution, right? We have to make sure because remember, we want the sodium hydroxide here to react with HCl. The indicator reacting with hcl is going to be bad because you are using up the hcl that's in the analyte flask that's why the indicator must never react with the substance that is being titrated or the analyte otherwise you'll get false results now the next important thing is the indicator must change color within a specific narrow ph range and this is kind of similar to how why the equivalence point must be equal to end point kind of similar idea so these are the properties of good indicator all right so what would your tradition curve look like this is something that you did in chem 150 lab last semester all right so in this lab, what you did was you had a burette clamped all right so uh i think your titrant in the chem lab was a base if i'm mistaken sodium hydroxide known base 
And if I'm not mistaken, I think you titrated citric acid content in Kool-Aid or something along that line. All right. But here, since we're talking about the tradition of a strong acid with strong base, since NaOS is a strong base, This is going to be your HCl, lone base concentration. And you clamped the burette. I haven't shown the clamp. And then you have some kind of a pH meter that was inserted in here, right? So this right here, my blue, bad drawing, that's my pH meter. All right, so I hope this is like coming back. Make sure you understand. Now, this setup, what this is the first graph going to look like, right? Because let's see if I insert the pH meter which has into a solution which had HCl. We know that HCl is a strong acid, meaning that the pH is going to be pretty low. That's why around one pH of one, right? You start there, right? So now over time, what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start dropping this sodium hydroxide solution, drop wise, one ml wise, and as you add NaOH. What's going to happen is that NaOS, sodium hydroxide, is going to start neutralizing the strong acid. Right? Then that means as you add more base, what should happen to the pH of the solution? Right? That means it still has pH of 1. That means when you add NaOS, the pH that is going to start increasing. Right? Because remember, pH is my y axis. My the volume of base that I've added is in my x axis. All right. And then at a certain point, let's say when you're adding 25 ml, that change from 25 to like 26 ml is going to start being constant, the pH solution. And this is where you might have drawn the line and figured out the pH or the amount of base that you added and after a certain time what's going to happen is the equivalence point is reached and you add more NaOH and then the pH value is going to start increasing because now the solution is basic all right so easy way to think about this is this part right here tells you the solution is acidic that means there's still more HCl in the solution here than NaOH this part tells you this is basic all right so now i want you to think about this graph and try to pictorially draw what i just drew here to kind of understand as to what this graph is telling you and then this caption right here is giving you a hint right so i hope this makes sense and think about what went into the burette here what went in the flask, which is the analyte, which is the titrant, and those stuff. All right. So now, for this kind of monoprotic acid, if you have a monoprotic acid, strong acid, if it reacts with a monobasic strong base like HCl and NaOH, if I do the titration, my calculation becomes really easy. All I have to do is use this formula. Again, to use this formula, keep that in mind. I have to use this monoprotic strong acid and monoprotic strong base, which is correct in my case, right? NaOH is a monobasic strong base, monobasic, and then this is a monoprotic strong acid. So when that is true, this formula right here is true. Volume of the base times molarity or concentration of base equals to volume of acid times concentration of acid because remember in our balanced reaction the number of moles of base must equals to moles of acid at this equivalence point Now let's try to use that formula to answer this question. 
it's asking me how much 0, 0.0 molar NaOH is required to completely neutralize. 50 ml of a 0 0.10 molar solution of HCl, right? So look at my formula. It says BBMB equals to BAMA. So it's asking me how much volume of NaOH means. I do not know my volume of base. But do I know my molarity of base, MB? Why not? Because they have given me 0 0.20 molar. Most equals to volume of the acid. And it's us told me that I neutralized 50 ml of the acid and the concentration of the acid MA is 0 0.10 molar. molar. Molar cancels out. And then my final unit is in milliliters. If I do the math, I'm going to end up with 25 ml. That means to completely neutralize 50 ml of a 0 0.10 molar solution of SCL that chemist should add. 25 ml of base from this bill rate. So now, this example was the titration of a strong acid with a strong base. But what about if you have a weak acid and a weak base, right? So let's say if you have a pH scale, you have seven, zero and 40 and what we said is the strong acids are going to be around zero area right the weak acids are going to be right in the middle in between zero and seven probably around three four ish it's going to be a weak acid something neutral is going to be around seven right this is going to be my weak base around between seven and ten and right around this 14 area is going to be my strong base right now these two graphs shows you the titrating of weak acid with a strong base or a weak base with a strong acid all right it's the same the only difference that you might notice a couple of things the first thing that you're going to notice is since the weak acid is being titrated and we said weak acid has a pk a ph in between zero and seven and look at that that's why you started around three ish for the weak acid. For the strong acid, if it was strong acid, look at the pH. You're starting around pH of one. That's the only difference. And the other difference between this graph and the other graph is whenever you try to do a weak acid with a strong base, this point right here is way small, right? Look at that versus this point whenever you're charging strong acid and strong base that means the amount of base that you've added right at this point is stable over a long time for a strong acid and a strong base where it's not for this right there's a short window period that's why after you added like this 20 ml of this base that's when you have to start adding drop wise to get to your equivalence point all right so now same thing over here, right? If you look at this, we're looking at a strong base versus a weak base. A strong base means I said PK, sorry, pH of around 14-ish. That's why strong base starts around 13-ish, pH of 13. Whereas if it's a weak base, definitely it's gonna be around seven and 10, right? This one has around 11. That's why this is a weak base. And again, if you look at this, span of the pH of the solution is staying changing at a constant volume, literally. Whenever you add more, as HCl is way smaller than this right here. So again, I just want to make sure you are able to identify these kind of graphs, whether a strong acid is being titrated with a weak acid, or the other way around, or a weak acid is being titrated with a strong base, or a weak base with a strong acid based on the graphs if they were given to you. All right, so now, now let's work through some of the titration problem that Alex gives you. The title from, from Alex, 
gonna be under this objective calculate the PSL weak acid treated with a strong base all right so and for this problem I'm going to solve this out for you all lots of work going around but then what I've done here is to make your life easy I have like broken down these into steps so this is my step one this is my step two and this is my step three and I would kind of like at least start out with these steps right that you are actually compatible with all these steps because remember in your exam whenever you have questions that you there you have so of work so your work right so let's say if I give you this problem in the exam you are gonna answer that in eCampus. If you do not get this answer, guess what happens? You lose that 0 0.5 points. But if you at least so step one, two, and three up to some point, you get that other 0 0.5 points for showing the work, even though you do not get this answer. You might have done some mathematical mistakes somewhere along the line. All right, but at least we know that you understand the process as to how to get there. All right, so let's look at this problem. Again, it does take some practice. Only working through one problem will not get you there. So make sure you are working through all the Alex problem based on this concept. And so anytime I see this kind of problem, what I do is I draw my burette and my flask and I figure out my, which is my titan, which is my analyte and such. All right, so now let's delete this. The goal is finally what I have to find is the PS of the solution. So you've added a strong base it has my base. All right, and my flask, my pretty, pretty neat flask. That's right. Acid, and this acid right here is a weak acid though. So it's three CO two H, and if it's easy for you, you can write the H in the front. Just remember, this is the ionizable proton. All right, this is acetic acid. And my base that I had used was sodium hydroxide. And the amount that they added to this solution here was 5 ml of 0 0.200 molar concentration of NaOH. All right, so now my end goal so let's say i put this 5 ml of 0 0.20 molar base sodium hydroxide in this solution of acetic acid where i have 50 molar sorry 50 ml of 0 0.100 constant molar concentration of acetic acid All right so remember what they are trying to do here is basically so you start adding this base to this acetic acid. Then at, after a certain volume of the base has been added, they're asking me what is the pH of this solution after the base has been added. So let's see if the base is red, right? After a certain time, you add the base and you're gonna get that equilibrium concentration and then they're finally asking you what's the pH of the solution, all right? The way to do this is I'm just gonna follow, the, follow that flow chart. First step tells me, write the equation. So remember, this is the acid. My first step is I write the equation. My acid, I'm gonna write my H in the front so it's easy for you to see why this is an acid. It reacts with the base, sodium hydroxide. And please don't be surprised, all right, if Alex, does not write down sodium here and just you just OS minus for sodium hydroxide it's the same thing all right doesn't matter now since this is 
at equilibrium because you have a weak acid and strong base but it doesn't matter right anytime you have a acid and a base the product is going to be salt and water so the first thing is i'm going to write my water which i'm going to get from this h of the acid and then this oh and then my salt my salt is going to be ch3co2 minus and then n plus all right so think about is you think about this is exchanging partner right so this partnered with sodium and the h partnered with the oh that's how you get my product so i'm done with step one all right so first thing make sure it's balanced i look at it and it looks like it's balanced next step the next step is what can be tricky so next step i've said using ice table calculate the moles and finally the concentration of reactants the first thing i'm going to do is calculate the number of moles of each of these base and the acid so let's find the number of moles of my sodium hydroxide which i can find out by i have the volume given the concentration given right because remember that molarity is moles per unit volume or moles per liter so that means if i multiply that 5.00 milliliters times 0 0.200 molarity is moles per liter all right now the other unit for molarity can what's this this is really important if you have moles per liter this is the same as millimoles per liter sorry millimoles per milliliters keep that in mind these two are the same thing so this is milli in the numerator milli in the numerator they cancel out which is the same as moles per liter all right that's why i'm going to do the same thing i'm just going to use the millimoles per milliliters here and you'll see why i did that because it makes my life easy because i can now cancel out the milliliters and milliliters and so i hope this makes sense moles per liter is the same as millimoles per milliliter and if you see that what's that milliliters and milliliters cancels and then i need it in millimoles doesn't matter i'm just going to write that down so sodium hydroxide is going to be 1.00 millimole i'm going to do the same thing with acetic acid number of moles of acetic acid is going to be 50 ml of 0 0.100 0 0.100 millimoles per milliliter and again like I, the reason i'm doing this is to make my life easy that way i don't have to convert this milliliters to liters that's why i'm doing this concentrate in it's going to give me 5.00 millimole all right so for my step two so using ice table calculate the moles done right so i calculate the moles of both my titrant as well as my analyte all right then it says finally the concentration of reactants and products all right now remember at the end in the end i have to kind of figure out the ph after the solution reaches to equilibrium all right that's why if you look at my work what i've done here is i've created the ice table right so this is my reactant this was my reactant acetic acid with the base giving me my cst2 minus conjugate base and on the acid right and i just showed you how to calculate this number of moles once the, these two start reacting they are going to have some concentration but this cst2 minus will not have any concentration yet because we haven't formed any cst2 minus yet that's why it's zero millimole and you might be wondering as to can i use the ice table if it's just the moles yes you can use the ice table but instead of saying like equilibrium they might use the term final it's the same thing all right but you can definitely use the ice table even if you 
use the units of just the moles instead of molarity. This is what I did. Again, I already showed you in the white board as to how I got these numbers, the num millimoles of CS to CS, CO2, OH, and OH minus. All right, now, what's this? So, you start out with one millimole of OH minus, right? Then you start adding that sodium hydroxide, OH minus, to CS3, CO2, OH. But do you see how we have five millimoles of this? All right, other way to think about this is you've added only five ml. That means what's going to happen is the OS minus is going to run out first, right? Because you added 5 ml. That means all this 1 millimole of initial OS minus is going to run out, and that's going to be my change. And that's why I have that minus 1 millimole, all right? That means that all this 1 millimole is going to disappear. That's why minus 1 millimole in my change, and the CSCCO2OH is also going to lose one millimole based on that reaction with OH minus. And then the CS3CO2 minus is going to gain one millimole. So I hope this is making sense as to how I got that number one. Right? Because remember, that's the number of moles for sodium hydroxide. And since sodium hydroxide runs out first, it's all it gets used up by reacting with this acetic acid. Now the final is always initial plus change. That's why five minus one is four, one minus one is zero, zero plus one is one. And not surprisingly, right? Look at this. Since all this OH minus was used up, right? That's why in the end the concentration of OH minus has to be zero. Right? So this is what I'm going to use to figure out the concentration of reactants and products in the mixture after the addition is complete, right? So one thing to keep in mind, now to find my concentration, my formula is number of moles, let's see if I'm trying to find the concentration of OH minus, divided by volume, but my volume has to be the total volume of the solution. Since you added five ml and 50 ml, total is 55 ml, that's why the final volume, total volume is going to be 55 ml. Right. Now, based on that, I can easily easily find out the concentration of this reaction and product, right? Ah. So CH3CO2H is, it has four millimole here, four millimole right here. And the final volume was 55 ml, number of moles there by volume that will give me the concentration in molarity. And remember what I say earlier, right? Do you see how this is millimole and milliliters? It's the same as moles per liter. That's why I use the term capital M, molarity. I'm going to do the same thing for the concentration of CH3CO2 minus. I have the final concentration, sorry, final number of moles, I have the total volume, Moles over volume will give me the concentration of CS3CO2 minus. Now, what I'm going to do is, in my third step, remember my end goal is to find the H3O plus or the H plus concentration, right? Because I know that my formula for pH is minus log of H3O plus. Let me see if I'm able to find the concentration of hydronium ion at H plus ion. I can figure out the pH. Now it says use K for acetic acid. Now Alex will give you this value of K, acid dissociation constant for acetic acid. Then my setup for the K based on this equation right here is going to look like this. And now I know my K value. Check. I know my concentration of CS3CO2 minus. Check. Check. I am the concentration of CS3CO2H, check, check, and the only unknown in this equation is my concentration of hydronium ion. All right, so that means now I can do my math and then solve for H plus, and this is the concentration of hydronium ion H plus that I'm gonna get. 
Now to find the pH, you know the formula P is equal to minus log of H plus, plug in the value of H plus, and this is how you get the pH of the resulting solution after you added this much ml of the sodium hydroxide, right? To this much volume and concentration of acetic acid. Again, lots of parts that you have to bring them together, take your time, internalize it. And hopefully when you work through Alex problem, things will start getting easier. All right, moving on now. Buffers, so I'm just gonna talk about buffers, what they are, then I'm going to probably just show you one formula and I'm gonna work out depending upon how much time I have because I don't want to overwhelm me with all these new concepts. All right. So what is a buffer? Or what does it do? So let's say if I have I drew a nice picture to kind of so what buffer is finally I lost it. Okay, it's right here. That's what I thought. All right. So let's say if I have a beaker with water. Right. And if you stick a pH meter in there, this is my pH meter. Right? That's electrode over here that can take you the pH. And it will probably give you the reading somewhere in between six and seven ish, right? Six point five and seven point five. Let's just say it's about seven. All right. Since this was my water. Now, if I add some HCl, let's just say I added like to this, there was like 20 ml water, and I added like let's say about three to four ml HCl. What you've learned is HCl is a strong acid. So what's going to happen to this? I'm hoping you already have started thinking about this. If I had HCl, so let's just denote my HCl with this green. Now green is the bad color. I need some contrast. Yeah, orange. So let's say my orange is my HCl. Then if I stick the my nice little pH meter in there, now the pH meter might give me a reading of let's just say pH equals to kind of roughly around two to three. All right. But do you see how the pH changed drastically? Right, so it went from seven to two to three. Now remember that number that it that that is in the logarithmic scale. So you're talking about pretty big change, right? Now, but let's assume I have a solution in my another beaker. And I'll let you know. So let's just call this solution. I'm just gonna call this solution right now all right let's say i stick my pH meter in there and let's say that pH meter gives me a reading of around five to six this seems the same amount right earlier we had said water 20 ml let's say that solution was 20 ml as well now i'm going to do the same thing what i did earlier here I'm going to add 3 to 4 ml of HCl. All right, after I add it, I'm going to stir it to make sure the equilibrium has been raised. And for some reason, what happened here is my, again, my orange is showing the HCl here. If I stick my pH meter in there, weird thing happened. Because we assume that after you add HCl, the pH will 
go down or drastically go down, right? But then what's going to happen is the pH is going to, let's assume, stay around kind of on the same number, 5, 4.9-ish, 5-ish, all right? Whatever we start out with. Now, what is happening here is basically this solution is what we call the buffer. That's it. What just happened here is this pH didn't change as much. It remained constant. So basically, based on that, trying to define this, right? So let's see if I can create a solution that maintains a relatively constant pH. When an acid or a base is added, that's called a buffer. So again, I want you to think about this, right? At least try to analyze this. Oh, this is what buffer does. This is all what buffer is in chemistry. Nothing fancy. Think about this picture if it helps you. Picturally, I hope this was clear. All right, so now the question is, okay, you might be thinking, but how do I create this buffer solution then, right? What do I need to have in my buffer solution? And what you need to have in my buffer solution is, you need a weak acid and it's conjugate base. Now, there is some gonna review for you. Remember, uh, whenever I started talking about acid base equilibria, we learned how to write a conjugate base of an acid. So let's say if you have an acid HA, to make a conjugate base, what you do is you remove the H plus. That's why H is H A conjugate basis A minus. Right? That means if you have a solution that has a weak acid and its conjugate base, H A and A minus, that will be your buffer. Or alternatively, instead of using a weak acid, I can use a weak base, but then that weak base has to be with its conjugate acid. Again, review for you. To go from a weak base to a conjugate acid, you add the proton. Remember, what I talked about proton is the same as hydrogen, hydrogen plus, add proton, or add H plus to a weak base to give you a conjugate acid. That's how you can create a buffer solution, either or. All right, so basically, we give you a term for buffer capacity, right? So I gave you an example here about, oh, five to six staying around five. But after a certain time, the solution can hold to so much, right? For a constant pH. When you add too much of HCl, this will definitely, the pH will start changing drastically. And that capacity of the buffer that can absorb before the pH changes is called its buffer capacity, right? So basically, if the buffer is good, means it has a very high buffer capacity, right? So as it doesn't matter how much HCl you add, at least up to a certain point, the pH does not change as much. All right, so I hope this buffer concept is making sense. Again, I want to take your time, make sure you understand this concept. All right, so we're going to, I'm going to stop here. Buffer, so today's, I think you just have gotten a one hour, 15 minutes of lecture. Uh, so hopefully this wasn't too bad, not over overwhelming to you all. Take your time, start working through your knowledge check. Questions that I have up here so far that I, I think you should be able to answer. Yeah, at least three knowledge check questions, let me that bad. Or I'll finish this and then I will start uh, free energy delta G concept tomorrow.